air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, animal extinction, urbanization, overpopulation, the atomic bomb. The effects we have had on our planet are devastating. World industries release hundreds of millions of tons of harmful gases into the atmosphere every year, causing air pollution and acid rain. Cities and industrial zones dump untreated sewage and toxic waste into our rivers and oceans, killing entire ecosystems of marine wildlife. The rainforests that are home to more than half of the species on Earth are being subjected to slash and burn tactics, possibly causing the greatest mass extinction in the last 65 million years. Rural areas in every country are being overrun by an ever-growing urban sprawl. And since humans adopted agriculturalism, our population has been expanding exponentially, overcrowding the Earth. In the past hundred years alone, humans have damaged every ecosystem, preying on Earth's natural resources and disrupting her planetary cycles. Not living in balance with nature, as our ancestors did centuries ago, the human race has become a global cancer, so virulent, even Mother Earth may perish. The fact that humans have caused irreversible damage to the Earth is indisputable. But are we really a cancer on the planet? To understand this both cynical and rather controversial theory, information must be pulled from many different aspects of science and medicine. Investigation on the behavior of malignant cancer cells, coupled with the theories such as the Gaia hypothesis, are needed in order to bring this idea from an analogy to a theory. Studies have been made that show the similarities between human behaviors and the tendencies of cancerous cells to spread rapidly and uncontrollably, to invade and destroy adjacent tissues, to lose distinction, and to migrate throughout their host body. These similarities cannot be overlooked. Also, the Gaia hypothesis allows us to see the damaging effects of humans on Earth not as separate problems, but rather as symptoms of a disease infecting a superorganism. James Lovelock first proposed the Gaia Hypothesis in his 1979 book, Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth. His theory states that the plants, animals, and microorganisms that inhabit the Earth actually help to control its climate and surface environment. As paraphrased by Lawrence Joseph, the planet behaves not as an inanimate sphere of rock and soil sustained by the automatic and accidental processes of geology, as traditional Earth science has long maintained, but more as a biological superorganism, a planetary body, that adjusts and regulates itself. Granted, the Earth only supports life on its surface, the vast majority of the planet being inanimate rock. But this characteristic is also found in nature. A tree, for example, is mostly dead wood, with only its bark, leaves, and seeds containing life. Also, for example, the Earth's air and water cycles mimic the circulatory system of the human body. These cycles go through the established patterns of liquid and gas, which regulate the atmosphere's mixture of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, much like the body regulates its own systems. Keeping this theory in mind, it is possible to see the human effects on this planet as symptoms of a disease. Medically, the four characteristics of malignant cancer cells are rapid, uncontrolled growth, invasion and destruction of adjacent normal tissues, dedifferentiation, and metastasis. A correlation can be drawn between the growth of cancer cells and the human population boom. Normal cells stop reproducing when they come into contact with other cells. Cancer cells, on the other hand, do not stop piling on top of each other and hardening into tumors. Likewise, even in overcrowded areas like cities, humans continue to reproduce with wild abandon. While regulatory options are present, they go largely unnoticed and unused, and fail to curb overall population growth. As Warren Hearn said, 
The fact that some humans limit their fertility effectively, do not reproduce, or advocate the widespread availability of methods of fertility limitation does not change the corollary fact that human species as a whole does not operate at this time under any constraint on the growth of its numbers. The next major characteristic of malignant cancer cells is their invasion and destruction of adjacent normal tissues. As a cancer grows, it consumes more and more of the cells around it. This is very similar to the growth of cities, which expand, consuming the surrounding areas and towns. Take, for example, this picture of London in 1800. Over the next 150 years, it can be seen that the size increases dramatically. In the process of this expansion, fertile lands and ecosystems are overrun and destroyed by the expanding city. Both tumors and cities require large amounts of subsistence. As a result, tumors will use their circulatory processes to harvest nutrients from the surrounding cells, much in the same way that cities import food, water, and supplies from the surrounding area. However, both tumors and cities eventually overtax their supplies, often causing the centers to die out, as is seen in inner city neighborhoods. In 1955, Alan Gregg noted how nearly the slums of our great cities resemble the necrosis of tumors. A third defining behavior of malignant cells is the differentiation. In the human body, cells from different areas have different characteristics and can be recognized as being from that area. For example, a muscle cell from the leg looks different from a muscle cell from the diaphragm. However, a cancerous cell often loses these distinctions. While a cancerous cell can be determined as a muscle cell, it is impossible to determine what muscle it is from due to the differentiation. Similarly, human culture is becoming increasingly homogeneous, as an increase in contact creates a loss of difference between individual people. Take capitalism, for example. Across the world, capitalism has westernized entire cultures, imposing its system of beliefs over that of the indigenous peoples. The differentiation of urban layouts is also increasing, as the skylines of major cities from across the globe are becoming increasingly similar. Today, urban centers like Chicago, Sydney, and Hong Kong have grown from their easily distinguishable skylines into common cityscapes. A. Kent McDougall said, Major cities are becoming indistinguishable from one another in appearance and undifferentiated in function. Central business districts so resemble one another that travelers can be forgiven for forgetting whether they are in Boston, Brussels, or Bombay. Cancer cells adhere to each other more loosely than normal cells do. This causes them to spread throughout the body to locations far from their organ of origin. This is called metastasis. These cells travel using the circulatory and lymphatic systems in blood and other bodily fluids. Humans do the same thing. Ancient humans were populated originally in Africa, but soon began to spread to other areas of the globe. These primitive peoples use waterways to reach lands not accessible by foot, acting in similar ways to cancer cells in the human bloodstream. And, as cancer feeds off all parts of the host organism, each human population adapted quickly to their surroundings, finding what they needed to survive in every place they went. Rapid growth, invasion and destruction of adjacent cells, dedifferentiation, and metastasis. Typically, as criteria for diagnosis, cells need only display two of these traits to be considered malignant. Humans display all four. While this does not provide conclusive evidence that humans are a cancer, it does show that they act like one. Regardless, the end result is the same.